All right, everyone, welcome to the Lifting the Iceberg podcast. I'm sitting here with Alexis Spatty, Alex Gray, and Allison Gray, and we are a week out from coming back from Burning Man and experience that, experiencing that all together, and I just wanted to sit down and talk about our experience, and I want to talk about what Burning Man is. Um, Burning Man evades traditional definitions, you know? It's not quite a festival, it's not quite an art show, it's something like a temporary city, a countercultural outpost for experimentation and realization. Uh, a great quote by Eric Davis, who is a friend of Cosm, uh, he calls Burning Man a promiscuous carnival of souls, a metaphysical flea market, a demolition derby of reality constructs colliding on a parched void. I thought that was a really interesting articulation. Very poetic. And my first, <laughs> my first question directed to you two is, um, before we get into what Burning Man is, I just want to ask you, why and when did you first attend Burning Man? And what was that experience like? We were invited uh, by Richard Wolff, um, an incredible um, technologist and um, philanthropist and uh, from a family of media specialists in Columbus, Ohio. He uh, was a good friend of ours in, uh, who, who invited us and sponsored our first trip to Burning Man in 2003 mm. when Zena was 14. So Zena came with us for the first time, and uh, there is actually a, a YouTube video of us doing the, um, the public talk for Palenque Norte called um, Psychedelic Family Values. Hmm. What do you tell the children? That's appropriate. Yes, yeah. so Zena was part of that, and she actually speaks for... Uh, herself as a 14-year-old uh, who has never tried uh, psychedelics or any kind of substances. So it was a very interesting talk. Rick Doblin was there, and um, a lot of other big shots came to our talk, and, and uh, you can see that on YouTube. But anyway, that was it was 2013, thanks to Richard Wolf. 2003. I mean, 2003, excuse yeah. me, yes, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Thanks to Richard Wolf, mm. and he's an amazing person. Still lives on, you know, in in the you know in the Haight Ashbury mm. district. He's right there, you know, living right in the middle of San, Fr San Francisco for his whole life. Now, what did you know of Burning Man before you went? Like, what was the word on the street? You know, what, what? no, I don't even remember if I knew anything about it. Mm -hmm. Did we? Oh yeah, no, Burning <laughs> Burning Man. There was a uh, wonderful article on Burning Man, like. Mm, a few years after it uh, started uh, happening in the desert mm -hmm. in High Performance Magazine, which was uh, a magazine coming out of California, but it featured Larry Harvey's uh, kind of evolution from the uh, beaches of uh, San Francisco mm -hmm. then out to the desert for more... Um, open embrace of a, a kind of a blank canvas. You know, I think that every artist looks at a, a gypsum uh, plane yeah. like that and um, sees the blank canvas mm -hmm. of their imagination and possibilities, you know, on any scale and unimaginable scales. Mm -hmm. uh, previously un imagined spectacles mm -hmm. uh, uh, have have emerged there. So it's it's really a, a, mm -hmm. a quite a, what a wonder it's field. It's a perfect gallery for sculpture. Mm -hmm. Okay, for for monumental sculpture, and that's what it is. It's a monumental sculpture art fair, mm -hmm. is my opinion. But they also have many many other other features. So you have the moving, the kinetic art cars, which are really sculptural, moving sculptures. Mm -hmm. And there's, they're moving stages. So it, it absolutely supports new music at all times, and people are dancing at all times, and people are doing acrobatics and circus and all kinds of movement arts. There's, you know, it's so large that there's room for uh, all kinds of uh, spectacle attractions, one of which we have been fortunate enough to become a part of in the last f four years. Mm -hmm. We were at Burning Man several times before that, but in the last four years, 
we have been uh, associated with the foam home, mm-hmm. which is where the uh, David Brauner, the incredible philanthropist, uh, has started to uh, offer the um, water experience of a lifetime. Private you never foam forget performances. it. Private foam performances. What's it called? They call them private foam performances. The private foam performances, <laughs> but it's it's collaborative. And everyone comes in and has this experience mm-hmm. and dances and there's musicians and there's art being painted. Mm-hmm. And it's just the most extraordinary daytime event. But then at nighttime, the place is just teeming, mm-hmm. isn't it? Yeah. What did, was your experience, Alexa? Oh, the foam, the foam experience was amazing. I mean, that was like something that I've never been part of. Just to kind of be a guardian for you two dur- during the day, watching you paint Star Dancers, which has been this ongoing masterpiece collaboration. And just just seeing so many naked people, that blew my mind. I, I loved it, actually. <laughs> and, and kind of participating and, and, and being grateful that we had the foam there because, the you know, Mm-hmm. You can only imagine what the dust is so far until you're actually at Burning Man, and to have that that cleansing for how many days was it? Like three days? We, only mm-hmm. four days. Four yeah. days. Yeah. Four days. Yeah. Um, four days. We did it Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and then yeah. Sunday they break it down. Yeah, and that was just I think super special. Just to be in an environment where people were in a non-judgment zone, they could be really comfortable in their sexuality and be naked together and it wasn't this sexualized thing at all. Like we, I would get in conversations with the stranger and they're totally nude and we're just looking at each other's eyes and scrubbing each other's backs to make sure <laughs> we get the dust and, uh, you know, <laughs> off, off the back of your neck and, and everyone's laughing and singing and, and dancing. Mm. It was, it was I, really I just want to say that I think it's like a public service for the people, the thousands of people yeah. that are yeah. able to go through there because they make such an emphasis on respect uh, for Consent. each other and and for um, no no photographing, yep. no staring, yep. and they make no touching. And they, they no touching, no washing of anybody who, unless you get absolute. Yes, consent, not right. an eye glance. And they, they go through all this yeah. on the yeah. while you're listening to this incredible music yeah. and having this wonderful time. Mm-hmm. They're reminding you of the principles of what it really means from to, to ho- have to be consent. Mm-hmm. What is consent? From homo erectus to fomo respectus. Yes. <laughs> that's what he said. Yeah, good. That's such that. a good exactly. one. Exactly. And yeah. Burning Man is really good at providing containers for us to experiment and to do things differently you know it's at burning man where you can dance naked in a dome filled (laughs) with like uh, dozens if not over a hundred other people people and and feel completely comfortable with that you know we're often not given an arena to uh come to terms with our nakedness with our nudity you know that was something like i have i've never before that been nude around other people in a in a public space like that you know like that that's your face can i tell you something i have to say i am the only one in this group that was not nude Mm. in that dome and i have to say i felt perfectly comfortable too okay yeah i i did not judge myself because i am not going to do that it wasn't so much me being nude, frankly. I don't. I've been nude in public yeah. before, mm-hmm. but it, it's just I. Uh, I don't feel comfortable doing that activity. Mm-hmm. But do I judge people for doing it? Not at all. Right. I really think that it's really fun for people, and I talk to a lot of people who felt the way I felt. Yeah. So it, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that uh, anything about it was anything but absolutely beautiful. And mm-hmm. I really respect everybody that did it. It made them feel wonderful and divine. You know, it was un- it was interesting. Just to, just to continue with that for one mm-hmm. second, Tony Robbins. When we were about to walk on fire, because I walked on fire with Tony Robbins mm-hmm. on numerous occasions, and before we were wa- about to walk on fire, he said, "There are some people that will just do everything that everybody else will do, mm-hmm. and it's good if you are like that. Don't do this activity." Mm-hmm. And I felt that way. I felt like I could just do it because everybody wants me to, but you know what? I'm not that comfortable with it, totally. and I'm happy with my You're busy with painting. my clothes yeah. on yeah. and yeah. taking my shower. And see, because Alex took a shower in there twice a day, yeah. I got to use the shower in our in our trailer once a day, and yeah. I just showered myself, mm. and I just was so happy. 
I, yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't want to say, you know, for people to feel like you have to go to Burning Man in order to, and you have to be naked. naked. Yeah. Do they have a naked That's parade. That's not in the tent. Yeah. 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 Some people don't feel comfortable with it either. Yeah. But they don't, nobody has to judge each other. Mm -hmm. right? Everybody can embrace whatever it is, you know. I kind of looked at it as an obstacle that was um, valuable for me to try to overcome you know, uh -huh. uh, be, being nude. And also just looking at a psychological, from a psychological perspective, we're the only animals that wear clothes. We're the only we animals are. when we take our clothes off, we feel embarrassed, you know? Like, what, what is that, you know? How come Adam and Eve became uh, embarrassed and self-conscious of their nakedness? What is the uh, wisdom behind that story? Why do we, why is that an aspect of being human, the desire to be clothed? And I was just, I was kind of contemplating that as I was dancing in a foam <laughs> that being sprayed at me out of a hose. Yeah. Um, There's nothing wrong with the feeling of, of, of privacy. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, 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 if it, and if it pleases you, it doesn't, it shouldn't, it shouldn't harm or, or offend anyone else. Right. Mm -hmm. I was in the bathroom the other day though and a baby deer with spots on it came out of the woods and was staring directly <laughs> at me naked at the window. Yeah. Yeah. There was a window between us and I just, he had never seen a naked person with no right. clothes on. I thought of exactly what you were saying. Mm -hmm. um, nakedness and fire, I think, and control of fire mm -hmm. are things that really separate us from mm -hmm. the other creatures yeah. of the earth. I will say though, like, fashion is such a cool creative art form and you really do see that at Burning Man too, is just the different yeah. head pieces that people are wearing. Not just nudity, like, but the exact opposite. Yeah, like, like <laughs> elaborate costumes. I'm like, how are yeah. you comfortable in that? But oh, damn, you look good. You yeah, know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But well, you know, that um, so at Burning Man, you've got this situation where uh, there's public, or it's not really public because they are private mm -hmm. foam performances, performances. Uh, for hundreds of people. Yeah. Uh, but thousands. Okay. Of people. So, but uh, like at one point, so you see a swarm of flesh dancing mm. uh, happily to music without. Uh, any interference or any friction in it it enhances the altered state mm. of having never seen or been amongst uh, that cascade of uh, flesh mm -hmm. and being surrounded by your uh unknown friends who are equally ecstatically dancing to the beautiful music and feeling a sense of freedom mm. that uh, because of the relaxation of those restrictions mm -hmm. and the special coincidence that you find yourself in having just been through a foam experience, mm -hmm. now you're in an experience where there's a lot of dancing naked people. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it's divine. It's extraordinary. It's absolutely divine. It's heavenly. It's it like is. a rung of paradise uh, on earth. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, uh, for me, uh, of course, it was uh, merely a matter of research. Uh, I, I had no particular interest in dancing amongst naked people. <laughs> sexually or anything like that uh, but you could see the painting at much better uh, you of know course. kind of like way and to see it amongst other yeah. dancing mm. people was also an energetic yeah. mm. kind of thing i could see what they were seeing yeah i could in a sense feel the uh from the various levels what was going on and what was our level of participation and i felt like we sort of stood for the eternal dance mm. of the cosmos of creativity, mm. that each star dancer was a burst of energy mm. uh, of the cosmic universal creativity. Each one of us is, a, what else are we, you know? Mm -hmm. And so uh, as that and as representative of a frozen... Um, moment of uh, an eternal 
on uh, of an eternal kind of uh, appearance, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the effervescence of the selves that uh, move through that space over the day, you know, they appear to the, ca you know, the casual painter observer of the mass of flesh moving and there, that's very distracting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, that is basically the same mass of flesh, mm -hmm. but it's always changing. Yeah. You know. And the whole thing, I think that whole kind of dome was designed to kind of curate this connection between people. And the, what we're talking about, the star dancers, for people who don't know, uh, they can check that out on your Instagram. I think you recently right. posted it. And uh, on that painting, you have these rainbows yes. connecting Rainbow. the heads. Yes, uh, we do. What, what's your favorite color? Rainbow. Rainbow. <laughs> rainbow. It was and, really fun. And that rainbow Me getting together with A.V., you know, like, you yeah. know, like to have something to say. And we... He kept doing it like over and over again, so it made it kind of a, that like was a very fun. Yeah. Anyway, the whole thing was incredibly fun, mm. and I love painting. And over the last four years, you see, we've seen an evolution in that in that particular mm. uh, attraction. Um, but uh, where, you know, they've 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 really made it nice for us. They've mm. made it nicer for everybody. They they built all of those all those places yeah. for people to put their clothes. Yeah. It's become an incredible attraction. Yeah. But anyway, we also saw those people down in, uh, in Washington, D.C. at the mall. You can go and mm. join them if you're in that area, the Washington Mall. It's a, it's a Catharsis mass. on the mall. Catharsis mm. on the mall. Yeah. It's a 24-hour festival on the mall in Washington, D.C. to it's really to, you know, to, uh, you know, kind of a... Uh, uh, maps. It's for maps. Mm -hmm. The multidisciplinary association for psychedelic studies, and they have and a, a rally. Visionary and culture visionary culture in general, mm -hmm. yeah. I believe, and um, I th I think mm -hmm. that David Bronner's been a stand by supporting uh, all these various uh, organizations, including and Cosm, mm -hmm. and and has uh, included Cosm as well. And uh, I th these are all really forward-thinking kinds of, um, you know, organizations right. we're very honored to be associated yeah. with. That was mm -hmm. the cool thing about the camp that we were part of. It not only did they offer this foam experience, but then right next door they had the, like, entheocentric tent where it was a full speaker series for, I think, those four days, too, starting with Rick Doblin from MAPS, and you guys did a, a We did a talk about visionary, visionary art. art, and Amanda. Yeah. yeah. And, and it was a, a vast Android array. Jones. Of Android Jones. Yeah, and of artists and clinical psychologists. And Paul Stamets. Paul Stamets was there. Stamets. So it was both a like fun, cleansing experience, and then you went over, and then you got a full download on what's happening in psychedelic culture and visionary art, and that's such a cool mesh. I think um, it was a brilliant yeah. camp, mm -hmm. you guys. Brilliant, yeah. Brilliant yeah, we camp. Got, we got the good one. We Very had, graceful. we had, and yeah. I don't think that he'd mind it if I mentioned that we had Danny Elfman, the great, you know, music producer mm -hmm. and yeah. composer, was in our pod. I mean, he's just a great musical yeah. guy. Yeah. And we had wonderful, wonderful stars, but we also had just wonderful people in, yeah. our, in our camp. It's a rather extraordinary Super camp. Genuine. But it's only one, one camp of I many. Know. I know. 80,000 yeah. people. We had about 350 in our yeah. camp, I would think. I yeah. feel like yeah. I didn't even scratch the surface. Oh, it's exactly it. And as you were saying that it's the perfect venue for uh, sculptures, as you were yeah. saying, I, I wanted to... Uh, mention that one that you often mention, which is social sculpture. Mm -hmm. Social sculpture. Social sculpture is really, when you get down to it, all, the ultimate thing that Burning Man is about. It is. Mm -hmm. Because it's about finding a way for a community to uh, come together, to rally together, to create something beautiful, extraordinary, and unforgettable. Mm -hmm. And uh, to create a group mystical experience. Mm -hmm. But let me say this, the, the person who coined the phrase social sculpture was Joseph Boys, and mm -hmm. his de the definition of social sculpture though includes the intention for the creator, or creators in this case, the many people who make it, to have transformation happen in society. Mm -hmm. So you're having a transformative 
social experience or experiment. That's yeah. And that's what I think that on the grandest scale Burning Man is. Because it's not only, uh, well, it's, it's, it's fully um, not even a barter system. It is a gift economy. Yeah. Yeah. That means that you shouldn't expect anything for what you give away and you should just give it away. And you can go there and have a blueberry pancake breakfast <laughs> Or a seafood salad lunch. Yeah. Our daughter and her boyfriend used to stand in line for those things. You yeah. just have to stand in line yep. and you get it. You know, yeah. if you see it on the schedule, you can go eat there yeah. and go to all the different booths because they give stuff away. And frankly, not on our side of the playa so much, but there's huge open bar stuff going mm -hmm. on yeah. all over the place. You know, the, 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 the alcohol consumption is, is so because they, they give it away. So thirsty. Yeah. Like they give it away. Hydrate. Yeah. Well, <laughs> open bars, like you can give but it yeah, away. Cool. Well, I think you know? <laughs> gifting is a really amazing concept because in a way, if everyone was giving equally, everyone would be provided for. You know, it's like mm. if everyone uh, kind of gave what they could, gave their all, then everyone would be receiving what they need and everyone would be part of giving someone else what that person needed. That yeah. sounds like a nor the, the natural functioning social organism mm -hmm. where people are not, uh, where people trust uh, that the same motive is in the hearts of uh, the participant. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that uh, Burning Man does uh, that we also uh, uh, feel inherently as, as part of our uh, value system too is empowering each person as an artist right. and as a creative person. Mm. You know, that, that ultimately you're responsible for your creative actions in the world. And so it empowers the creative person. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, uh, you know, uh, yes, we all need to then work together as mm. individual creative people. Right. And when we can agree on uh, what we do together, uh, we can create something beautiful together. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is what is seen time and time again. Well, it Burning sounds Man. like socialism to me. It's a social <laughs> sculpture is comes right out of socialism, which would mm. be to each according to their need, from each according to their ability. Mm. So you give your ability. And mm -hmm. we all do this when we go to Burning Man. Mm -hmm. Everybody, you know, I mean, my, well, you, we all know people who are super professional in, in the world and all that. And they get in there and they're building and they're carrying stuff, you mm -hmm. know, and, uh, and they're doing some very physical work. So, we, you know, we all, we all come to it with whatever our ability is mm -hmm. and, uh, and offer that. It's well, each great. little pod and then each camp is a different kind of, socio-political organization of themselves yeah. and an organization of individual like artists and as well. The country. And well, we each has our... an imaginal self as well, you know, and it might be a wholly preposterous kind of imaginal thing that they're all like taking on for the time, you know. Mm -hmm. It's your freedom to imagine and uh, you know, I think that that's the great thing, you know, that Burning Man has and all festival culture has is uh, the greatest nation on earth. They share the greatest nation, the imagination. Mm. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, and I want to I wanna talk more about, like, kind of what Burning Man is. Um, uh, so for me, like, I was talking to um, Joe Sapinora, who's the host of the Entheogen podcast, and he had a really in interesting perspective on Burning Man itself as a psychedelic, as a place where we can manifest our mind, as a place where we can, uh, yeah, manifest our mind in a way that we can interface with it and, and grow and, and imagine new directions for our society, for our culture. Um, and when I was looking at the man, I was kind of, I, I have my own interpretation of what this symbol of the man burning means. Some of this, I think, is uh, maybe just projection. I remember saying to Alexa when we were walking up to the man and everyone was just crowded around it waiting for it to burn, I just thought, like, how crazy human beings are, what we'll do <laughs> around building up a little statue and knocking it down, yeah. and the amount of meaning we'll project onto that. Well, the history but, of the burning man, though, mm. goes way back to pagan times yeah. mm -hmm. and 
but way before we knew about Burning Man, we used to come up here to the Center for Symbolic Studies where they would uh, have the, mid, the, the midsummer uh, festival, but it was really the end of summer festival. It was kind of like a harvest festival. I forget the pagan name of it, really. Mm -hmm. But we would, people would dance around the Burning Man. They would build a man out of bales of, mm -hmm. of hay, basically. And this was a tradition that goes way back. And if you haven't seen the movie The Wicker Man... Yeah, that's you, a great that's, movie. That's, you know, it's, it's just about that, that sort of... Uh, uh, ritual that mm -hmm. I think may be global, and I'm going to do a little <coughs> research on it this yeah. week. I will do that for mm -hmm. our for our yeah. workshop next workshop. week bow, bow. on Saturday from six from three to six. We're going to be doing a workshop on Burning Man and the and festival culture. So uh, I want to find out a little bit more about the history of the Burning Man, mm -hmm. but it is goes way back to the pagan. Uh, yeah. The the Center yeah. for Symbolic Studies offers you know sort of the 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 main pagan. Uh, festivals and ceremonies, and we we met a lot of our friends there. Brian James, for one of them, and ah, you know, it's man. it's just been you know uh, incredible. So, but anyway, yeah. yes, they burn the man, and yeah. it's the end of the summer. It's a harvest thing, and I find it to be like, you know, like look, the the fall is like a new year. Even though we yeah. celebrate New Year's on January 1st, that has nothing to do January 1st with the celestial anything yeah. or with the way we, we, our habits through the seasons. See, the end of, of autumn is the end, I mean, the end of summer, the beginning of autumn is the beginning of a new year. And in Judaism, it is the new year. Mm -hmm. So that's coming up in the end of this month. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it falls on the first new moon of the autumn. Hmm. You know, after after the after the autumnal equinox, it's the first new moon after that, and so you know it's all it's all you know according to the stars. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, that's uh, this is a new year, and I feel like when people go to Burning Man, they cry at the temple because they yeah. feel this separation from their past. They they memorialize and they mm -hmm. say it's over, it's gone, it's the end of an era. Yeah. But really, the end of a year, and they start. People go back to school, and right. they. You know, vacation's over, and they get back to work, and whatever, and they head towards, you know, the, towards the, the 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 winter. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it is a new year of sorts, mm -hmm. and it is a new year for uh, for religions that are based on the stars and the moons. Mm -hmm. But why so much experimentation with new ways of doing things around what would be traditionally a harvest sacrifice? You know, like uh, one of the things that I thought when kind of looking at the man and I remember sitting at the bottom of it kind of just appreciating this kind of uh, circular terrarium of plastic at insects at the base yeah. and it was so ornate and so beautiful and I just was in complete disbelief that they were just going to burn this um, and I got into a discussion with a guy who I uh, who said that's the point build it burn it build it burn it and then I kind of like had this realization that what I think the man represents is culture. I think that um, culture is symbolically represented as masculine as opposed to nature being symbolically represented as feminine. And I think that cultures, as they grow, they tend to lean towards tyranny, lean towards, towards being very rigid and, and oppressive. And I think that uh, it's important to completely uh, to um, occasionally update our culture uh, to burn down the things that don't serve us anymore mm. and create new things that serve us in the direction that we want to be going in. So I think that burning the man is dispensing with the aspects of culture that no longer serve us and celebrating new visions of what we could bring into being. I think this is why so many people experiment with new realities, reality tunnels, to use a term from Robert Anton Wilson, uh, we're experimenting with new values, new realities that we can inhabit, you know? Um, and I think that's why Burning Man attracts so many artists, because I think that one of the true roles of the artist is to envision new realities, envision new futures. Amanda Sage is doing that with her vision train, you know, inviting artists to create their vision of their of what they want 
the year 2030 to look like because it's the artists who kind of go out into the unknown and map it and bring it back in, the, in some kind of tangible form for other people to look at and, and to glean some insight from and potentially reorganize the way we organize ourselves, you know? Um, that's pretty much the definition of visionary art. Yeah, exactly. You know, you go. And that's why visionary art culture you go, is so big at Burning Man. Exactly. You go fishing in the, you know, super consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, and then you bring it into form. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of the art uh, that is on the playa um, engages. Uh, realms of the human imagination mm -hmm. that are not uh, easily addressed in the art world that exists today. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a different social um, structure that allows uh, a temple, a temporary temple to be erected mm -hmm. that allows for uh, a collective memorial to take place, these are authentic religious functions mm -hmm. that are occurring within the context of a art performance yeah. uh, installation kind of um, you know venue. Mm -hmm. We speak of it in that way, and I think that's the best way to hold it culturally at this point. Mm -hmm. But because of where we're at. At Cosm, uh, I can't help but see uh, Burning Man as a, a kind of a symbol, uh, and and truly one of the world's greatest symbols of the um, power of uh, the the cell, the renewing power of the creative mm -hmm. spirit. Mm -hmm. It's a phoenix for one thing, mm -hmm. and but as you say, this kind of phoenix that. Uh, is hardened into, uh, in this case, if we, you know, addressing the man mm -hmm. element of it. Um, Amanda, to mention her again, she uh, had heard that uh, Larry Harvey had been to the Vinatok uh, celebration outside Gunnison uh, in Colorado and seen a burning of an effigy before the Burning Man uh, began on the... Uh, the beaches there in San Francisco, the, evidently the next year or something like that. But it's the, uh, and the, uh, also the Wicker Man did come out around that time as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, as a symbol of the um, uh, taking down of the man. The man. You know, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the ah, Burn the man, you know. Yeah. He's like, he's yeah. telling us what to do. <laughs> Damn it. Not you know, it. Yeah. and so, so that was what happened in Vinatok. They had decided right. that there was a some asshole who was, you know, commanding everything and probably the wealthiest person around, and you know, and they had the most power and everything like that. Mm -hmm. And so it could have been political, could have been corporate, could have been, you know, and they would go and they would build the effigy of the man on their lawn and they would, you know, have their gripe and grouse fest right there and burn the man yeah. and then go back to work. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, they had, you know, they had spoken, they had had mm -hmm. their, yeah. you know, you know, their way to shake a fist and say, yeah. we're not happy and we're going to burn yeah. the man. And you can totally feel that, like just thinking about, because the man burning on Saturday and then the temple burning on yeah. Sunday, those are two completely different mm -hmm. experiences where the, like, what you're saying just a minute ago with the man burning, it's like a bunch of fuses that are just like, pew, 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 like everyone's yeah. just so excited and the energy is at like a full climax and yeah. at some points i was just like i am in an arcade game right now <laughs> like looking at all these it does amazing look like art that, cars. there's so much neon and there's yeah. so right. many lasers there's right. so much light on the playa i just want to tell you about the first time we ever went to burning man in 2003 we were with the church of wow <laughs> and in 2003 <laughs> They had one laser on the playa. Our guy, Richard Wolf, the technician, he was a technology, technological genius, really changed the way we watch movies, okay? Mm -hmm. Let me just tell mm -hmm. you, the whole streaming of movies to movie theaters was because of Richard, oh, Richard. Wolf. But in any case, 
He brought the first laser to the playa. You wow. know how many lasers are oh coming guy. off of one <laughs> art car now? Yeah. But that was only one green laser yeah. that came out at night from the Church of Wow. Mm. And if we were out in the middle of the playa looking at stuff, because they did have some lighting out there somehow, yeah. but they didn't have lasers. So we could see our laser. It was all the way. Oh. And you could find your that way home. Yeah. And everybody else was sort of finding their way home in relation to that green right. laser. Yeah. It was the beginning of lasers on the playa. Well, it, it, it seemed like uh, the playa played a game with you in that oh, sense, where sure. at first we had this gigantic, big neon elephant as, yeah. as, as like a place marker right. to navigate through and, and everything's and, dropping and then, like and then, flies. Well, then yeah. it got destroyed. We had that head which stayed pretty constant throughout the whole time. There and then the there was folly. The, the folly. Yeah. But then the man and like all of our um, <laughs> it, at first you could kind of treat these big sculptural elements in the playa like stars that you can navigate through in the same way we would look up at certain stars in the so night sky to find yeah. yeah this is something Johnny Harris was explaining to me. It's like the the sculptures the art is how you navigate through the terra incognita right. that is the playa but soon <laughs> they, kept, like they just kept yeah. dropping like flies <laughs> and the night of the burn we had some so we had some serious trouble getting home <laughs> because all of our guiding lost. stars were destroyed but and the temple wasn't destroyed. The temple yet. wasn't. That is like but, uh, a forest. But this is it's one of those ways that Burning Man will yeah. kind of throw you into chaos to see if you can swim through it. Well, even within your own like grouping to find your trailer, you know, the right. people are always like there's a sl swimming that goes on and things start moving around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we were very well located, so yeah. we could always yeah. find our we, way we home. We had a, some good markers for sure. Yeah. But they do tuck that 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 foam home back into yeah. the living areas, the yep. residential areas. They tuck it in. They don't want it to be right out there yep. on the playa. So you got to go find it. It's, we had yeah. the big pink Merkaba on top of our tent. That's right. That was they our give you North that. Star. Yes, they yeah. do. Even just like riding, a, I mean, the bike riding, you felt like you were bike riding on the moon and just mm -hmm. like following like our group. The bigger the group, the harder it was to keep up and just like stay in this chain link you know because everyone's got lights on their butt yeah. like i wish you know that was the one thing what you're saying about your friend richard just having like one laser laser like that that kind of <laughs> sounds lovely you never know? Like again all, all these lasers are trying to compete with the stars really and yeah. it's like that's the yeah. best light show in my opinion it but really it was, is but you can was, really see yeah. them out in the middle of the playa yeah. you can really see yeah. a lot but of stars there were parts beautiful. there were parts when we were biking through the playa like through kind of dense areas of art but then we got to a spot where there was like just a big expanse of nothing and our friend Torrin said it felt like we were in between galaxies you know <laughs> that or like we were kind of floating through space yeah. and like some parts of the playa like felt tangibly colder than other parts too dark matter the dark yeah. matter we were going Whoa. through it uh, and and you know it's also funny too going into burning man I thought that the fashion aspect of it, the um, radical self-expression, which is one of the principles, I thought that was kind of like a little vain. Like I'm not one to dress up in flashy clothes or like put too much attention into being as extra as possible. But I realized at Burning Man that all of that fashion, it's functionality. You want to be as visible as possible yeah. during Burning Man so you don't, don't get Don't hit lost. me yeah, with yeah, your yeah, art yeah. car! Yeah. Exactly. And I then, find my, 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 my fashion, which is ex extremely different from everyone else's fashion because it's so nothing. Mm. Nothing. You Subtle. be nothing and you actually stand out. Yeah. So mm. and you wore black. I didn't wear black though, but I don't know. I think that f I think that it's it's glorious that people dress up. I don't mm -hmm. think that it's wrong not to though. Yeah, but I was surprised time. by the functionality of it all. Like, like the fancy goggles. They were mm -hmm. maybe bedazzled, but it also was they were goggles to protect your and eyes. like yeah. big yeah. scarves. <laughs> oh, they're actually dust masks yeah. that you pull over beautiful, your mouth. Beautiful. Yeah, it's, and it's all like these kind of big, boots. big yeah. boots. Oh, I get it. It's like there's dust everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> You're walking on a desert. Yeah, um, yeah but uh, yeah, I want to get back to this idea of um, the man burning. Um, 
And I think that the man can also be represented not just by like certain people in our society, maybe the, the wealthiest ones in our society, but more abstractly, the man is the traditions, the conventions, the habits that we all kind of um, adopt in our culture. And, and we were programmed yeah. and Burning Man invites us to question those things. Like I think one of the things that Burning Man invites the discussion about is uh, monogamy and politics polyamory and different ways of organizing sexual relationships, you know? Um, there's a gigantic orgy dome at Burning Man, you know? <laughs> why, why would there be, I was kind of trying to look at that from like an anthropological perspective, like why are all these humans getting together in the middle of the desert and erecting this gigantic dome that's meant to have orgies in? You know, well, it's, because it's a that's a segment of our of our society. Mm. There are people that are actually really attracted to that. They used to have a a, a drive by shooting range, and they used to Whoa. have a genital. Yeah. They used to have a genital <laughs> portrait studio. Go have your genitals photographed. All right. And and they used to have for many years. And Zena was talking about it. The the the, the Thunderdome. They I used, saw the Thunderdome. Did that they have the Thunder, Thunderdome yeah, out there? They so have it every Mad year. Mad Max, there's like this big geodesic dome that two people are hanging on these elastic ropes yeah. and they're jumping at each other. At and they have these big Nerf bats. And people, like they're very substantial yeah, yeah. Nerf bats. And people bats. are like, it's from a movie called Mad Max. Yeah, yeah. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah. And they try to j knock them off and they're oh, swinging. They're so swinging so around. We rode past it the yeah. first night. It's really yeah. amazing. So these are the different kinds of attractions that you have. And I'm sure there's a biker village. I'm sure that there is that there's definitely we went into a, a, a place on the ply that we had never been before which was for the super high-end people it yeah. looked like it, a vast lobby uh, a cross between a vast lobby of, a, of the most magnificent hotel contemporary hotel and and, and and a you know and and then some sort of futuristic movie because the ground was simply the playa mm -hmm. and on that they had laid like you know, sisal rugs and couches from, you know, some modern store, some contemporary mm. store. And there were people there having, you know, highballs and there was an open, it was a club, basically. Mm. And there was, there was an entryway. It was like going into, you know, like seriously high-end real estate. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, and I didn't get to go see any, any uh, um, major, you know, star trailers. But that's right. what's back there. Mm -hmm. They come completely equipped with a bar, with a with a complete bar, mm -hmm. and your 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 satin sheets and whatever, and all stocked with the food that you've asked for. And they, you you fly into the Playa Airport. Right. You get shuttled from there to your trailer, and that's where you start. And you can order whatever you want: the bicycle, the the the, the uh, whatever they call it that you know travels along mm -hmm. motor or whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's uh, something lost? With experience Burning Man like well, that? Well, I am, I'm of a different uh, variety than many, I mm. know, in thinking that it's very important for these people to be there. Mm. Mm. Yep. I feel like, okay, yeah. because they would not be there if it weren't for that. Yeah. And, um, and I will let you talk in a second, but I just want to say I've been doing some research on the Rainbow Gathering, which is kind of like the other side of, of what it is. And they are also... A barter, more barter and gift economy. They they do both barter and mm. gift, and they've been going on since after um, uh, Woodstock Festival. The 1970 was their first rainbow gathering. They they collect in the national forests of the U.S. and camp, and it's free, and everybody brings and everybody gives and everybody takes care of each other, and they and you can go with nothing and you can be taken care of and there's always a piano. So it's like it's thousands and thousands of people. They bring pianos into the middle of the woods and they bring musical instruments and they have an incredible free gathering. It happens every That's year. Cool. And it, the, the peak, they say, is July 4th weekend. You know, July 4th, actually, any time of the week. But in any case, there is an opposite there and that is everything's free, but rich people don't go, mm. okay? So you want to get people together in unity and harmony and make beautiful things. It's a different kind of, of, of approach. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you have then enormous projects, you know, enormous projects, like we saw the temple and, and then a Larry Harvey's temple and then the, mm -hmm. uh, the man uh, pavilion and they create incredible structures there 
for people to be to get together yeah mm -hmm. to get together you know and, and and be free well the uh theme at burning man this year was metamorphosis mm -hmm. yeah. and uh in the foam home uh there was the fomogenesis kind of um you know transformation of uh the of a person to the uh to the best that they could be basically and i think that that's the the quest that the artist always has mm -hmm. is that how can they make it better and so every year uh the um you know burning man represents you know a wide variety of of uh, folks who have uh, been uh, funded by Burning Man itself for the um, for inclusion on the you know the kind of the main map mm -hmm. and uh, then also welcoming all the various artists I think it's a remarkable uh, kind of uh, setting for creative people mm -hmm, and yeah. invitation yeah. to creative people and the reason that it's of interest to uh, the wealthy and, and folks who would like to display their own um, and, and have their own social setting there is that there is sometimes an intermingling of audiences mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and intelligences uh, that allow for uh, what I will hope uh, to be an opening uh, to the transformation in society. One of mm. the most hopeful discussions that we had uh, was with a, I think a, a genius uh, engineer, uh, Matt Atwood, mm. uh, and his current projects of carbon mining. Mm -hmm. Now, yep. uh, the carbon mining from the atmosphere becoming a practical thing that makes oil mining for oil uh, less attractive yeah. and in fact uh, less uh, if it will cost less than than drilling mm. then we have a contender for the way that the um, oil and fossil fuel industry will move forward mm. and the most hopeful thing because I thought well we ought to get those guys those rascals who knew that they were killing the world uh eight in the 80s you know like a like a tobacco kind of lawsuit mm. that would you know like bite back and get them to fund the creation of these machines mm. that would help to uh carbon mine the atmosphere mm -hmm. I've never heard and, of that mm. well yeah, it's never. a fascinating thing yeah. and and See, uh, Matt has been developing this along with a number mm. of other engineers that how do we draw carbon directly from the atmosphere because right. that's, that's what's choking the yeah. world right. and what's driving up the temperature. And mm. so he has developed this kind of brick uh, kind of thing that, the, um, that, that carbon clings to mm. and is like s basically sponges that rotate around a thing wow. absorbing this then can be washed off and you have pure carbon that then can be sold on the open market mm -hmm. and uh, can be energy. used in any of millions of ways. Wow. So uh, this is a practical thing that is getting some funding now from a oil partner. I'm not sure which one, so I don't want to say, mm -hmm. uh, but, the, the but this why. would be, but this would be a positive step forward, just like Rick Doblin, who wants to integrate psychedelic medicines to mainstream society. Yeah. Matt, without opposition, the, the oil companies are coming to him and are looking for future solutions. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be out of business because of climate change. Right. Who would? It's gonna make they don't want to ruin the world, really, now <laughs> that it's really coming to pass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they really would like to invest 
in a future for all of humanity mm -hmm. to succeed. That's what I think the big dream is. And yeah. this is why I think it's so important for people like that to go to Burning Man because sometimes they get some value from some of the amazing principles because that's very much in line in alignment with leave no trace. Yeah. You know, like we want to get there. We don't want our existence on this planet to leave a negative trace on Mother Nature. You know, well, that's why we so need to update of, Father Culture. There's so much of that thinking going on at Burning Man, the, the ecological thinking that's going on at Burning Man. And there is a factor of people who actually have the power and the means to make a difference. Mm -hmm. So you're putting together brilliant minds like Matt Atwood, who's been... Uh, in charge of basically producing the camp. Mm -hmm. He produced our camp, Entheon Village, mm. and he produced Maps' camp back ever since Back in 2006. Then. And mm -hmm. so now we're back with Matt Atwood. He's always been the producer of the camp itself. He's oh, the provider that. of the compost toilets right. for the mm. whole camp on, in many other Thank camps. Thank God for those. And, <laughs> and the Abraxas is his. So he, oh, is, cool. he is a huge provider wow. for the camp, but he's always... He's always been in the field of energy. Right. He was one of the early uh, biofuel people that, when he was really young, picking up all the oil from all the fast food places and turning it into biofuel, mm. and they sold it. It was a business for a while. And then he went into algae, like trying to turn algae production wow. yeah. into fuel. And he's Brilliant. evolved that, I believe, into the carbon mining. So, so wow. by t trying to take out from the water, he learned that it would be better to take it out of the air, that the water gets it from the air, and to take it from the air, the water would process its own, basically it would become mm. less and less pH imbalanced. He, yeah, he was saying yeah, that the pH imbalance is one of the things that hurt, hurting the coral reefs and everything mm. like that, and also the fish. And so, because where does most of the carbon fall? into the water mm -hmm. right. because that's what mostly covers the uh, the earth. And this is, the, you know, a concern I didn't even have, you know. It's like, oh, my God, you mean you're polluting the oceans and everything? Oh, it's yeah. terrible. So he said, well, I, and so how do you sponge it out of the oceans? And he says, you can't. So uh, he said by removing it from the atmosphere, there is a homeostatic balance between the ocean and the air. Mm -hmm. And that as it's removed from the atmosphere, wow. it, will it will begin be to leach out of the, out of the oceans. Wow. Yeah. And this is the only course we can take. Yeah. I mean, to sur so survive the planet? Okay, that, yes. That there are people there that he's there to speak right. with and who How relate important. to each other in a social setting. Yeah. Business is social, so things are moving in that department, mm -hmm. even though people say that it's so, you know, hurts the carbon footprint for all 80,000 of us to go there. You can't deny that. <laughs> okay. In anyway. the greater scheme, though, what kind of conversations are happening at Burning Man that might ignite yeah. uh, right. uh, solutions, exactly. you know? Like, sometimes, I, I mean... I thought it was funny when all those politicians flew on their private jets to like the the climate um, action summit in Europe. It's like, and they got the, all this criticism of like they're they're using uh, so much emissions to go to something to talk about how to cut emissions. But you know, maybe there were conversations had at that place which will reinvent the way uh, we. T transport ourselves. Well, that's what you, know? you hope. That's, that's always what you hope. What you hope. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think there are people at Burning Man, though, where they are really trying to help and really doing things. And there's lots of, you know, incredibly important discussions mm -hmm. going on, like all the talks that you were mm -hmm. speaking right. about. It. Yeah, I, I had this uh, kind of one idea at Burning Man. I thought that Burning Man is almost like a computer. You know, it, it's like a computational mechanism that helps generate um, new ideas, new, new systems, new, uh, new things that will be brought into the world, you know. Um, but I want to get back to Burning Man as a social sculpture yeah. because in a similar yet different way, Cosm is a social sculpture as well. Totally. Cosm uh, invites us to reinvent things, mm -hmm. reinvent the way we look at religion, creativity, the mystical experience. Um, what are some principles behind social sculpting that 
you are applying to Cosm? Well, Cosm is a sculpture co created by all the artists, artisans and uh, special working people that are here. Like everyone here is creative. If you're mm. in shipping, you're creative. If mm. you're in the store, you're creative. So wherever you are here to make the temple work and to invite more guests and, and to have a, uh, a, a, you know, a social system in which uh, we get along and make something beautiful together. That's the whole idea. I mean, why build a temple? Mm. Why even build a temple? Be why do they build it at Burning Man? They build it because everybody wants it. They want a place to, to find the others. Mm. The fact that we get so many thousands of people together around one temple is because it's going to burn. Well, the way we want to get everybody around this temple is because it's going to be preserved. Mm. We want to leave a trace. We want to leave a trace that in our generation, as Alex says, we built something other than parking lots and shopping malls. Mm. We, we, you know, that just still stand there and rot. We built a temple that represents our community and our core values, which are the values of acceptance and the values of love mm. and peace and prosperity and upward spiraling and, and, and act self-actualizing. Those mm -hmm. are the principles that we really embrace that everyone should be self-actualized and, and love their life. And uh, we, 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 we intend to create a beacon because that's what a church can do. It can be a beacon, a lighthouse where you can go and it's yeah. light. There's more light. We don't hide from the darkness. We know the darkness is there. We talk about it openly. But we also try to create a, pe a place of peace. Mm -hmm. That yeah. means that people are, who are not peaceful are not welcome. Yeah. And that's, you know, enraging for people who love to shoot people yeah. with guns. You know, it's, it's a terrible thing. Yeah. It's a terrible thing. Yeah. But, we, but we only embrace those who can get along and be peaceful. And we, mm -hmm. we have every right to, uh, you know, kind of make that distinction yeah. because we are a church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so the, temp the temple at Burning Man was probably the most grounding element of the entire week. I felt, yes. and everything kind of dominoed effect, I, I personally feel, out from the temple. And I feel like we do that a lot with Cosm. Like, yes, we're building this temple wh that will you know, house the collection of your work and the visionary art movement. But then we also have like the permaculture initiative that's happening around it. And we have these, this education center that we're building with workshops. And so, yes, this temple is something that we want to sustain and is a very grounding element, in my opinion, for people to have a mystical experience and reflect with themselves. And then there's this like all this action that's also happening around it that envisions a regenerative future and, mm. and encourages the creative spirit. And it's a container. It's exciting. It's a yeah. container. We have a 40 acre container full of woods and Turkeys. structures <laughs> and finished interior spaces where things can happen and wonderful open exterior spaces where things can happen. We have the <clears throat> incredible advantage of being able to have open fire because we're a church. Yeah. And we, um, we try to fill that container with as much variety, diversity, creativity, yeah. acceptance, interest. The church status allows you to have open fires. Yes. I wonder why. Why, why is that? Because it's part of our religion. Mm. Yeah. Bonfires in a retreat setting and things like that are allowed for the scouts mm. and uh, for religious organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's not something we do every night, but yeah. only for the special uh, festivities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, we've always been interested in, you know, uh, having these elemental uh, celebrations and cosmically aligned mm. with the full moon and with the uh, solstices and equinoxes and things like that, uh, because this is the sturdy uh, cosmic... Uh, alignment that the great religious traditions have always uh, pointed to, and they each have their own uh, different mythology, uh, but many of them fall fo and follow the same calendrical uh, kind of sequence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of the um, kind of tenets of 
uh, Cosm really is that uh, we think that creativity itself, that, that art is a religion, and that it's probably the oldest functioning religion on earth, mm -hmm. uh, because the only reason that we know human beings existed so long ago is because they left some art behind. Mm -hmm. And uh, we think of them as almost these caves as being the temples of yesteryear, mm. or th perhaps the light shows of last of yesteryear, <laughs> and uh, that that uh, it's responsible anthropologists are are positing that uh, that uh, early Cro Magnons were tripping on mushrooms, mm -hmm. going into these dark places and uh, with their flames and whatever, or yeah. just watching the light uh, play on these surfaces, because some are not that deep inside of the caves. Mm -hmm. Some are very deep, but uh, some are not so deep. And so with the easy hallucination of seeing shapes that appear to be like the uh, cows whose dung, out of, out of whose dung you were simply uh, munching on mushrooms moments before, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it has, you have a sacred cowish kind of a relationship with these creatures. You might want to put them all over. You might want to give them, make them a special feature of your cave art. Yeah. yeah. Which they were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also see the early uh, kind of visionary art, which is the human-animal hybrid, the uh, shaman of Troy Frere, the sorcerer the of Troy Frere. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. these, uh, these kinds of uh, visionary beings appeared uh, on in the earliest of uh, cave art. So visionary art, uh, let alone, like I guess in Africa, in Tassili, in Algeria, 10,000 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, where they had mushroom-headed beings carrying mushrooms. Now that's older than all the world religions, but there it is, any kind of, uh, you know, hippie could say, oh, that looks like a totally, like, <laughs> magic mushroom, yeah. little guy running around, you know, with more magic mushrooms. And now we're talking old-time religion. Mm. This is uh, where people got in contact with their divine imagination, and they would meet these uh, characters and things. And those are the the contact with this realm of visionary uh, imagination that comes into visionary art. Mm. And so we feel an affinity not only with the, um, the Vienna School of Visionary Art, but that uh, an affinity with the uh, most ancient and then through all of the sacred traditions, which all had temple building, and sacred art as part of their tradition or we would not know of them. Mm -hmm. Each of the religions have a story. They have a mythogem. It, each one of them is a beautiful expression of the divine. Mm -hmm. Each is a cultural lens or portal into that sacred realm. And so by acknowledging their interconnectedness, our our ultimate vision for Entheon is to put a face of God that goes continuously around the building, making it one Godhead, mm -hmm. seeing in all directions, and mm. incorporating as many religious points of view and perspectives yeah. as possible. Mm -hmm. Now, a symbol... Love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, back, back to fire, Alex. I, fire is a symbol and reoccurring motif in so much of your art, you know? Um, can you talk a little bit about the significance of fire uh, as a symbol, uh, as it relates to kind of the subject? Well, fire, I believe, uh, is also uh, symbolically uh, uh, associated with light. Mm. You know, the torch, the candle, the, all of these things are illuminating. So first of all, symbolically, it, it relates to illumination. Mm. And uh, illumination alludes to consciousness or awareness. Mm. And so uh, we use uh, the symbol of the triangle 
as the most simplified version and symbol of fire. Mm. Mm. I didn't know the that. up uh, rising uh, flame mm. is like the triangle. Mm -hmm. And so that is also a symbol of the triangle is the fire. Mm -hmm. But the and triangle so the means spirit, which means it's pointing upward rather than pointing downward. It's the spirit, mm. but it's also grounded. So it's about our spirit as well, because we are earthbound creatures with this upward pointing uh, look or, or, or upward looking uh, mm -hmm. self. Yeah. And then that's why you have spires on the top of churches and stuff. It's the groundedness of being an earthbound person, but the upward looking mm. of, uh, of the pointing up. Mm. Love that. Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, you know, um, Keith Critchlow, our uh, friend and teacher, of uh, sacred geometry uh, spoke of the uh, triangle in relationship to two other shapes. First was the circle, because mm -hmm. that's the one-sided sacred geometric shape and the perfect expression of basically spirit. So that is the realm of spirit. Uh, and then the other shape was the square. Now the square, he said, that is the material world. Everything is hard and solid and, and structural and, and that's the, what our association is with the, uh, with the material world. It's a block. Exactly. Yeah. So now you've got spirit and you've got matter. Mm -hmm. Now, what brings them together? Mind. Mm. Mind is symbolized by the triangle, mm. the up, uh, this uprising uh, shape, which also you can look at architecture all over the world and see the interplay of these three shapes, yeah. the square, the circle, and the triangle. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so what do we have with the Gothic arch? With the Gothic arch, we have the square, which mm -hmm. uh, of the material world, the downward pointing, the doorway, mm -hmm. basically, or uh, that. And then it rises up like an arch. An arch would bring the heavens mm -hmm. to earth, but then insert the triangle inside of that, slightly giving it a point so that you yep. feel mm -hmm. the triangle and you've got the mind uh, pressing on heaven symbolically. Mm. I think you have the circle in there too because it yeah. it, cause it, it inspires. Mm -hmm. It's an yeah. inspiring yeah. arch. And you know it's something I thought when uh, we were watching the temple burn. I, oh, I was really that. meditating kind of on this the symbolism behind fire because I with my symbolic mind I saw all of those prayers and those souls uh, and all those shrines made to the people who others have lost this past year. It's almost like the fire transmuted that energy into spirit, into smoke, into something that transcends devils. material yeah. world. A and the dust devils, that was amazing. Off the temple when it burned, these little like dust tornadoes kind of spun off like, like yeah. these souls um, almost passionately Releasing, moving on yeah. dancing dancing yeah. dancing away from everyone. the temple mm -hmm. and and oh. and taking those prayers into the highest heavens so because cool. they just those those pillars of dust yeah and embers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where they touched the ground it was red with with yeah. heat it mm -hmm. was like it reddened the ground with like like yeah. like hot coals and it, it moved away from the temple and these, and just repeatedly like up as far, yeah. and they went so far. Yeah. I've never seen that. And frankly, after that, I looked up other temple burns and you do see uh, death devils, but they're mostly in place. They don't like, this traveled so yeah. far, I was afraid it was gonna feet. go towards somebody. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. I wonder if it was like the engineering of the temple itself because it had that full sort of... And the alley, flatness. The, the flatness and like the, the alleyway of the temple. It has itself. a lot to do also with the weather conditions of the evening. True. Sometimes the, it's so still, the air. But I thought uh, it was there, still. The, the, uh, the air was not completely still. I don't know. It and, seemed pretty still. And uh, there was uh, the right 
evidently coordination of uh, elements to mm -hmm. create these massive. Yeah, but the tallest structures went first. That was yeah. another thing that was, seemed a little bit metaphorical to me in my condition. Yeah. It was just the, you know, where it, where it was sort of stepped, mm -hmm. the tallest went first. Mm -hmm. And the smallest went last. Yep. Mm -hmm. The lowest to the ground took longest to burn. Yeah. It was, it was just huh. I don't know. Does yeah. it mean anything? You know, you yeah. you 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 know, you're there and making everything significant. It was the hottest fire I probably oh, ever so experienced. Hot. How far away were we? And we, we still were, felt the we heat. had a really great spot. Far. By the way. We were really like far. probably a quarter of a mile away. If I not would, more, I would think. yeah, yeah, because the people that lit the firefighters that lit it were like, itty bitty little thing. yeah, and I took my jacket off. Felt like we were like right at the bonfire that we have here, you know. Yeah, it's very hot. Jeez, I'm sweating. <laughs> yeah, it it's cool. very, it's very sad. They they built that thing out of wood slats, yeah. and and we've seen other structures at Burning Man made with sort of cell, same that just make enormous four, with yeah. the same thing over and over again and these mm -hmm. were amazing these were not even two by fours they were slat yeah. wood another experience i had uh, regarding kind of the symbolism behind fire is when we were on the abraxas dragon having that tool listening party in the distance was the temple and there was a burn happening behind, behind the it. temple but right. it made the temple look like it was on fire it did it glowed being destroyed and that's something that I, I've seen in your work, so, someone or a figure in flames, but not being destroyed like by those flames, like holy fire, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I, I thought that was just a very powerful presence while we were having that incredibly powerful moment, you know, playing that tool It's out. like the burning bush. Yeah, the you burning know, bush, exactly. Which is, uh, yeah, and, and uh, the temple was not burning, and yet it appeared to be yes. on fire. Yeah. yeah. And so, well, you know, fire is obviously uh, pointed, pointed to by a lot of the different sacred traditions. You know, we see some beautiful pictures of a kind of veiled Muhammad mm. surrounded in flames mm. that are really quite extraordinary. And his, uh, uh, there are some Persian miniatures with quite extraordinary um, uh, pictures of the Barak uh, taking Muhammad to the seventh heaven and mm. going through flames uh, that uh, here uh, seem to symbolize both a purification through different levels of a golden light, mm. um, but they're also um, like uh, il illumination uh, because they're gilded in things. And so a lot of the uh, subtle body um, anatomy has been um, symbolized in... Uh, fire mm. like uh, kundalini itself the serpent uh, fire the serpent power you know uh, can be seen as this kind of illuminating mm -hmm. uh, force that dwells inside of us so you can see how the coincidence of of illumination or light mm -hmm. fire and uh, consciousness or awareness have uh, can fuse into something that mm -hmm. it, uh, can be seen as a, a transformative uh, symbol. Mm -hmm. And it's really the reason that I used it in the tool uh, symbol that I put on the Lateralis mm -hmm. CD that became emblazoned like a, a tattoo uh, on uh, thousands of people yeah. as a fire and eye. Fire and eyes. Uh, it's a, uh, a symbol of consciousness mm -hmm. and uh, in some ways of high awareness uh, because and passionate uh, uh, view, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because it, I, I think that art gives us a perspective or a view. It's the easiest way to alter your consciousness, you know, is by looking at somebody's, uh, you know, unconscious, subconscious, super conscious, Whatever they are, it's been blooped onto a surface, and that's mm -hmm. art. It, it is essentially the raw, naked worldview of that person, you know, that artist. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I feel certain. I certainly feel lit with inspiration after <laughs> the being at Burning Man with both of you and obviously you and the cause and community. It was. Any intentions come up for you around Burning Man, like mm. stuff you want to accomplish? I mean, I feel like my work with Cosm is only beginning, that's for sure. I oh, really I know. Do. We're and growing, I, Alexa. I, I feel like um, just it, it reaffirmed what can be manifested when people work together, whether it's, you know, cooking up meals for a camp in the kitchen or helping to decorate a, a, a space or just making people feel welcome, like all of those components are super important and I feel blessed to have been witness to that on a massive scale and I look forward to seeing how we can integrate that with what we're doing here at COSM. I think we're already doing a pretty great job, but yeah, I feel super stoked about that. Um, and it was just such an honor to be at Burning Man with, for the first time with, with all of you and, and every time you go, it's different and this was yeah. very unique. For yeah. us, let it me was just good say, time. it was fun. Yeah, it was. It was so much more fun for me this year, in many ways, say than than many other years. Surrounded by so because, many people who loved us, because yeah. we had a uh, the the friendship of our uh, crew and mm -hmm. friends and things yeah. like that, and so it was it was really wonderful to be with uh, you guys yeah. and. Uh, and to also have this little kind of philosophical Grief. decompression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for doing Integration it. Integration session. That's right. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Thank you so much, yeah. Tyler. Allison Thank Gray you so Alex much, Gray Alexa. And Alexis Batty. Thank you so much, Alex. <laughs> I love you. And I just oh. wanted to say, you guys are going to be talking about this more on Saturday. Yes. The, uh, what date is that? September. The 16th? Next Saturday. This Saturday from 3 to 6, yep. we're going to talk for a couple of hours with you about uh, Burning Man and festival culture. And uh, we're going to bring up, you know, a lot of these points, but also show lots and lots of pictures of, of our travels and uh, of other festivals. We're going to have images of festivals on every continent. Nice. And uh, there are Love festivals... That. And they, they celebrate, you know, art and music and dance and performance and film and moving image and laser art and, you know, every kind of thing. So we're, we're going to highlight a little bit of that and talk about why do we celebrate like mm. this and what are the, yeah. what are the different... Uh, Can't wait to learn more. Well, mm -hmm. thank you so much. And thank we you, hope Tyler. to see you yeah. all there. Thank you so much. Really Let's good. Leave it there. Fantastic. All right. Thanks, Thanks so much, you. Tyler. Lifted. Thank you. <laughs> the iceberg has been lifted. The iceberg all right. lifted. Okay. Thanks for watching. Bye, everybody.